It's good to see everybody tonight. Good to see friends here, family members, faith member community here. Um, I'm feeling really good and I'm really honored to be back. If you have never met me before or seen me speak, I'm a marriage and family therapist. I work here on staff. I have the honor of working during the daytime with Pastor Baltimore, seeing our staff members. Um, I really love working at a church that invests in caring for the people that are in charge of caring for other people. And the, the feeling in the room and just the presence of God feels so good, and I'm just so grateful for that. I also have a private practice. I work with couples and individuals in the evening time. Um, and I, uh, I'm just so grateful to be able to do that and to be here at the church. If you know anything about my story, you know that uh, I started out in my own recovery process. I'm in long-term recovery, and I worked for about nine years as a licensed alcohol and drug counselor, and that's what ended up leading me to the work that I'm doing today. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that uh, here in a minute, but the thing that's important for me um, to communicate to everybody that is that when I came through the program, uh, the things that I was learning was really important. And I think there's a lot of value in coping skills. I think there's a lot of value in understanding what are your triggers. I think there's a lot of value in understanding how to uh, maintain sobriety and how to prevent relapse. But the thing is, is that those things are effective in the short term. The thing that sustained me was healthy relationships relationship with God, relationship with myself, and healthy relationship with other people. And so it was really important for me to, uh, to pursue relationship work. And it was some of, one of the things that I saw in my work as an LADC was all my clients were struggling with the same things that I had been struggling with. They were all relational issues. They were all relational issues. And so I wanted to go out and I wanted to learn more about abandonment and about trauma and about rejection and how to heal from those things and then how to be in healthy community with other people. I was able to come in the springtime and we did a series called Relationship 101. And it was Pastor Trina, Pastor Baltimore, and myself that were teaching in that. And I did a couple sermons in there. The first one was understanding how conditional love, shame, control lead to isolation, emotional, physical, and spiritual isolation, and it leads us out of relationship. In contrast, unconditional love, grace, and empowerment lead us towards intimacy, spiritual and emotional intimacy, the ability to know and to be completely known by another person. It takes us into healthy relationship. The second sermon was on that we are fundamentally hardwired for connection with other people, to be in relationship with other people and to be in relationship with God. At the end of the last sermon, we were doing a Q&A session, and somebody asked, they said, isn't self-care selfish? And I gave an answer, and I stick by my answer. Um, I wouldn't change it. I gave an answer that uh, the time allotted for me. But at the end of the night, I felt like I, it just didn't, I didn't feel satisfied. And if it didn't feel satisfying to me as an answer, I'm sure it didn't feel satisfying to the people in the audience as an as a answer. So I wanted to come back and think about this more. And I was, really, I was really contemplating this, and there were some personal things that were happening in my own life that were bringing this topic to the surface. And I was noticing I was having conversations with other people, and there was things that were coming up for them as well. And so I've been kind of on this journey of exploring this topic of self-care over the last like three to four months, um, and I'm excited to share that with you tonight. I, we started last, uh, the last series with the core scripture, Matthew 22, 37 through 40. And I want to stay with that scripture. Now, there's a couple things you need to know. First off, if you're here for the first time tonight, or maybe this is the first time you've ever come to church, we talk a lot about this guy named Jesus, all right? This guy's really important to us. He's the hero of our story. And the reason why he's the hero of our story is because he came to save us from ourselves. Andy Stanley says it the best. If somebody can accurately predict their own death and resurrection, as Christians, we just do whatever he says. <laughs> whatever he says. So in the New Testament, if you see writing that's in the red there, that's Jesus saying those words, and we really need to pay attention to him. So that's the first thing. 
The second thing to understand is that the Old Testament is about the rules and the regulations that none of us can live up to. And the New Testament is about God's grace and his provisions for us to be able to have a relationship directly with him. And that's what this scripture is talking about. Now, it's also important to understand a little bit of context around what's happening in this scripture. So Jesus is talking to Pharisees and Sadducees. Now, Pharisees were priests. They were the religious leaders. Uh, in ancient times, they were given the, the authority to rule the Jewish people. The Sadducees were prominent landowners. They were the elite of society. They had, the, they had money. And what they're doing in, this, in uh, a few verses before this is they're trying to trick Jesus. They're trying to ask him questions to trip him up. And the reason why they're doing that is because Jesus is challenging everything that they represent. And Jesus' whole point for coming to earth was to break down the power structures and the power systems that kept people from having direct relationship with God. So he was going to take their power away from them and give it back to the people, and they didn't like this. So one of the Sadducees, who happened to be a lawyer, asked Jesus, he says, what's the greatest commandment of all? And Jesus says to him in verse 37, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as you love yourself. Upon these two commandments hang the whole law and the prophets. Jesus is basically saying, do these two things and you'll be good. Do these two things and it's going to cover the entire canon of scripture of how we're supposed to interact with one another. It's really important to understand there's two relationships in this passage that are obvious and there's one that's a little bit more hidden. We are called to love God with our whole being and we're called to love our neighbor, but we're called to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. Hey guys, welcome. So there's three relationships in there. Tonight, we're going to be taking a look at loving ourselves and how that connects with loving our neighbor. Now, I got to be honest with you. There is nothing that I teach on that I do perfectly. Nothing. Amen. Don't amen that, Pastor Baltimore. <laughs> I was going to give him a hard time, but then I remembered he can fire me, so I chose not to. <laughs> because I believe in self-preservation. It's just good self-care to keep, to keep your job. Um, but I made a promise to myself about five years ago that I would never teach on something that I don't try to live out, okay? And the reason why I'm going to be completely honest with you tonight is because at some point, I believe my wife is going to be in here and she's going to hold me to that. And there's been times where I've done well with self-care. And there's times that I haven't done well with self-care. One of the ways that I know this is, Krista, can you raise your hands? Thank you. Everybody say hi, Krista. So when I told Krista what I was preaching on tonight, she audibly laughed at me. She said, Sean, you are so funny. I'll come listen to you anyways. Hey, babe. This is my wife over here. How'd it go? Yes, yes. I'm so proud. Tonight, my wife got to teach for the very first time at Living Free. We had this amazing moment. About 5 o'clock, we went out and got some food together, and we pulled up in the parking lot. And, and right before we went in, uh, she, I usually kind of pray over her. And, and she, at, at the end of the prayer, she stopped, and she prayed over me. And it was just this awesome moment where I was like, we're both teaching tonight. This is so cool. <laughs> Glad to have you here, babe. I was just telling them how honest I have to be because you're here. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> One of the reasons why the topic of self-care is so important to me is I've worked really, really hard to kind of obtain 
this idea of family and happiness and wholeness um, over the last 10 years, and I'm going to be talking more about that here in a minute. But this summer, I finally took some time off. I finally had some downtime, and I'm sitting out on my patio, and for me, like, it doesn't get much better than this. It's early in the morning. It's still a little cool out there. The sun just came up. My dog is out there on my lap. I got my cup of coffee. I'm rocking back. It's gorgeous out. My wife is inside sleeping. My kids are inside sleeping. We're going to have the entire day together. Life could not be better. It's everything that I imagined when I was pushing through midterms, when I was pushing through finals, and I was angry. And I was sad. And I started crying. And I didn't know why. There was no reason for me to be upset. There was no reason for me to be angry. I didn't understand it. My emotions did not match my reality. And I remember I started praying at that time. And I said, Lord, what's happening right now? I need you to show me. Um, this was something that I was kind of noticing coming up inside of me. And he took me back and he kind of showed me what's been going on over the last 12 years. And, and I'm going to briefly go through that today because I think it matters. And I want to use parts of my story to kind of highlight some of the things that we're talking about here tonight. And so I came into Living Free in 2010, and it was probably six months to a year, and I started getting really involved, and I knew that I had a fire for helping people, and I knew I had a passion burning inside of me um, to add value to people's lives. It was the one thing that was sustaining me, and I just I felt so good about it. And so very quickly, I started volunteering. I was running multiple support groups. I was teaching, mentoring guys. I was working at a sober house, um, helping guys stay sober there. I was involved in praise and worship, and this was the first time in my life that I was really busy with good things. This is kind of the moment where my life started getting full. I knew that I wanted to be an addictions counselor, so I ended up going back to school in 2011. Now, when you go to school to become an addictions counselor, there's really two paths that you can take. You can either A, finish your entire four years of your bachelor's degree, then go take your national exam, then do your 880 hours of clinical internship, then do all of your paperwork and background checks, become licensed, and start working in the field. That's one way you can go. The other way that you can go is you can go get your associate's degree, take your core classes for LADC, which is Licensed Alcohol and Drug Counseling, and then you can start working as a clinician while you finish your last two years of your bachelor's degree. I chose this route because it had benefits for me. I thought it was going to be great, and, and it was, and it was the right choice for me to be able to go to school and then that night be able to come and practice what I was learning in a real setting. But this was the start of my 12 to 14-hour days. This was starting to get up at 7, 8 o'clock in the morning, doing homework, getting to class by 9 o'clock, two or three days out of the week, coming to a living free, working from noon till 9.30, getting home and going to bed, and then doing the, week, the, the homework on the weekends. Everything was fine during this time. Everything was fine. I was doing pretty good with taking care of myself. Uh, my wife and I have, uh, we, we openly share that we're a blended family, um, and so we work through those dynamics, and we have children part of the year, and part of the year we don't, and so our lives are kind of built for this, and so it made sense to do it that way for us. Um, and so I got to the end of my bachelor's degree, and I knew that I wanted to go on. I knew that I wanted to study more about God. So I was looking at seminary programs. I also knew that I wanted to do mental health work. I knew that a lot of the clients I'd been working with really benefited from mental health services, and I wanted to provide those services for our clients. And so I was looking for a program, and I found Bethel University, who had a marriage and family therapy program through their seminary. The only problem was it was a four-year degree instead of a two because you got both of those. And at that time, it made sense for me. And so I continued doing the routine that I had been doing all along. Coming into 2019, I was, I was, coming, I was getting a little worried because I was going to do something that I had never done before. Once you get to the master's level, you then have to again do the internships. You have to again take licensure tests, but you also have to write what's called a thesis. And this is basically the beginning workings of a book. And so I was getting ready to do that. 
and COVID hit. And when COVID hit, classes didn't stop, the thesis had to be written, and we knew that we had to meet the needs of the people that were struggling throughout COVID. I mean, do you guys remember what that was like when it hit? Like, we, we understand it now on the backside, but it was a scary thing. We were going into Target, and there's, like, no toilet paper. Like, who thought that would be a thing, <laughs> right? Like, the shelves are empty, right? We're getting ready to go on these lockdowns. Nobody knows what's happening, and there's a fear setting in with people in their hearts because of their finances and their jobs, and what are we going to do with the kids and school and all of these types of things. I am so proud to work at this church. I saw the best come out of our staff and out of our congregation. The only way that I can describe the environment behind the scenes here for the two weeks prior to the lockdown was being on a battlefield thinking triage. They were, I, I, Pastor Trina was calling people, get to the media department, we're going to be recording messages. People were coming in, they were sharing messages. I saw people working extraordinarily long hours. I saw people giving their own finances to help other people in need. I saw people sacrificing. The need was there, and the church stepped up to meet that need. We get through that. We start to see social injustice, societal reform, we're feeling unstable like we've never felt as a nation, at least in my lifetime. I don't know. Maybe, this, maybe other people have felt this way, but I've never experienced anything like we experienced. Political unrest. God showed me during my prayer time the reason why you're angry is because in your busyness of doing what looks like my work, you have not kept me at the center of your heart. It all looked great on the outside. Inside, I was dying. This was a strong call that God gave me to come back to rest, to return to him, to re-engage in self-care. Now, I want to be clear about this. There was never a time that I stopped going to church. There was never a time that I wasn't reading my scriptures in the morning. There was never a time that I wasn't listening to praise and worship. But going through the motions is not the same as being connected. Come on. Yeah, that's right. Good my heart wasn't there. So tonight, we're going to talk about that return. We're going to talk about self-care. And next week, we're going to actually dig into what self-care is. If My hope is, is by the end of the night, I've just convinced you that this actually matters, and you come back next week to learn how to do it. <laughs> Definition of self-care, Oxford, Oxford languages, the practice of taking action to preserve or improve one's own health, or the practice of taking an active role in protecting one's own well-being and happiness in particular, during periods of stress. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> the word stress. It's important that we understand what stress is. One definition says it's a state of mental or emotional strain or tension resulting from adverse or very demanding circumstances. Mentalhealth.org states, stress is the feeling of being overwhelmed or unable to cope with mental or emotional pressure. Here's the good news. God designed you to endure stress. You are uniquely capable of handling and managing stress. So the first thing that we need to know is that not all stress is bad. It can help us when we're in danger. And we're going to talk more about that fight or flight response and those stress hormones that get activated during that time. It can keep us safe. Stressed when, stress, when used appropriately, pushes us out of our comfort zone and promotes growth. Delivering on a deadline, midterms, finals, those things can help us grow and develop as a person. It can act as an internal warning sign 
if we understand it and we learn what to do with it. But it's also important to know that not all stress is good. Dr. Caroline Leaf, pioneer in the field of epigenetics. She is a speech pathologist and an audiologist. And she really laid the groundwork for the research that we now know as epigenetics. And what epigenetics is, is it's how our environment impacts us on a cellular level. So when we think about genetics, it's the biological passing between the parents to the child. Epigenetic is how our environment impacts our DNA. Now, what we need to know is that when that alarm system goes off in that limbic part of our brain and shoots off, it floods our bodies with stress hormones, epinephrine, norepinephrine, also known as adrenaline, and cortisol. And this activates that fight or flight state. It makes your heart rate pump faster. If your body is getting ready to run, blood pumps to your feet. If you're getting ready to fight, it pumps to your fists. That's how cool your body is. But when you have a child that is growing up in a highly traumatic home or as an adult is living a life that is constantly under stress, what ends up happening is those stress hormones start to erode our DNA. It's like a car battery. When the acid is on the cable long enough, the cable starts to corrode away. So when our DNA is ex exposed to stress on a long-term scale, it actually has the ability to shrink up the DNA and start to deform it. And when it does this, it turns genes on and off. And this can lead to mental health issues such as anxiety and depression. This has a negative impact on our relationships. I want you to think about it like this. We all have a tolerance window. And our tolerance window, when it's fully open, we have the ability to be empathetic. We have the ability to be compassionate. We make good judgment calls. We have self-discipline. I always go through the fruits of the spirit, and I'm like, check, 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 check. And then self-discipline comes up, and I'm like, oh. <laughs> put the cheeseburger down. When that stress window is open, we are able to be the best versions of ourselves. We show up well in relationships. But stress tends to close that window. An example of this. I have a great marriage. She, she can't hear. She says, uh-oh, here we go. Great marriage is not synonymous with perfect marriage. It's not synonymous with a marriage void of conflict. But my level of gratitude to be married to Ashley is overwhelming. I genuinely get into my truck at the end of the night and I feel so much gratitude that I get to go home and be with her. Now, years ago, because I, as a marriage therapist, understand that you need to cultivate an attitude and culture of appreciation within your relationship. And so I started saying, anytime I look at my wife and I think to myself, wow, she's beautiful. Anytime she makes me laugh and I think, oh my gosh, I love her silliness. Anytime that I feel just an overwhelming sense of gratitude for who she is and who she is in my life, I made a commitment to tell her that. And so multiple, night, multiple times a week, I call her and I just say, hey, I'm on my way home. I just want you to know I'm so excited to see you. I can't wait. On my really bad days, I give her a heads up. I'm a super needy person. I'm just going to be honest about that. I'm going to put it out there. On my really bad days, I call her up and I'm like, hey, just letting you know, I'm feeling extra sensitive tonight. I just need some time with you. I need to talk. I need to cuddle, whatever. Most of the time that works. Sometimes she's like, well, my day was equally bad. We're going to be watching TV, so just be ready. <laughs> Ready, be ready for that when you get home. So I spend 45 minutes driving home, excited to see her. And then I get home, and I start getting critical about things that she did. Or I start nitpicking at what she, how, this, how this happened. It's not the best way that that could be. 
And I'm thinking to myself, I'm like, why am I so excited to come home and be with her? And then I get home, and I'm just picking at stupid things. And it's because the stress level is so high. My wife and I, she's also in school and working a full-time job. We play Tetris with our lives, and everything fits perfectly to try to get it all in throughout the course of the day. And then anything that deviates from that creates more stress. And then we sit there, and we go at it with one another. This doesn't happen a lot. This isn't the standard for our relationship, but it does happen, and it's confusing when it does happen. Sometimes it takes us till what? Saturday afternoon, and our, our, our fights during this time are really funny because we'll like, be pulling out of the driveway, and I'll be grumpy about something, and we'll get like a block away, and I'll, I'm sorry, babe. This isn't even about you. I'm just stressed. I haven't been able to relax yet. We'll get about half a block away. She'll start getting grumpy with me, and all of a sudden, she'll say, hey, babe, I'm sorry. This isn't even about you. We do this for about three or four miles, and then we just decide to pray and say, let's let it go for the rest of the weekend, and we're usually successful with it. But it's hard for us to snap out of go mode and be in relaxed mode. When I'm overly stressed, I find myself becoming more judgmental. Do you know why we judge people? Because it simplifies our lives. You don't have the same belief system I do, you're over here. You don't agree with my political views, you're over here. You don't agree with how I live my life, you're over here. See, now I've just simplified my life because I don't have to show up well and manage my own anxiety during those conversations. And I don't have to navigate the nuances of being in a room with somebody who thinks differently than I do. So stress separates us from other people that God has called us to minister to. We can see that we're easily angered. Anger is a secondary emotion. It is a result from unmet needs, expectations, hurts, or insecurities. If you're angry, you need to stop and ask yourself why. One of the most beneficial things that my wife and I learned to do. One, we give each other permission to have fights in our marriage. We do the best we can to fight well and to not damage intimacy. But we have permission to fight because we don't want resentments. One of the best things we learned how to do was to ask each other, what are you really angry about? Because you often realize it has nothing to do with what we're arguing about right now. Yeah. I'm angry because this was said at work and my feelings were hurt and I felt rejected and I didn't talk to anybody about it. This unchecked promotes physical and emotional isolation. This is why in Proverbs 4.23 it says, above all else, above all else, else guard your heart for everything you do flows from it professor of mine dr lofgren one of my favorite professors to date says self-care is not a luxury it's an ethical mandate now he's talking to a room full of counselors and therapists at this time but i would make the argument if you are a christian you are called to be that in somebody's life as Christians, we're called to be good stewards of our finances, our bodies. We're instructed to tend to our thought life. We conceptualize our heart as a garden that needs to be tended to and garden. And most importantly, stay connected to the source of our life, Jesus Christ, our hero, so that we do not wither up and die spiritually. So we know it's important. Why don't we do better with it? Why don't I do better with it? I teach people how to do this. One, because self-care requires resources, time, energy, and money. When clients come in to do LADC work, I often encourage them to take time and slow down. Don't go get the full-time job just yet. Don't go to school just yet. Take time to get to know who God is because God's going to reveal to you who you are and when you understand that, you're going to build the foundation for the house that is going to withstand the storms when they come in life. And you do not want to skip steps when you're building your foundation. 
You can put the time and energy in now or you can put it in later. I always tell couples that are coming in thinking about divorce, it's going to cost you time and energy one way or the other. You can either fix it or you can get rid of it. Either way, you're going to spend time or energy. What do you want to do? Things that give you immediate payoffs rarely have long-term benefits. All the things that are worthwhile in my life I had to work for and I had to embrace delayed gratification. Self-care takes an act of faith in the beginning because you don't see the results from it immediately. The second thing is I think all of us have some unhelpful narratives running around in the back of our head. It would scare you if I told you how many of the decisions that you make on a day-to-day -day basis are due to your unconscious or your subconscious. I have here a few of the, the things that I think run through my head at times and some of the ones that might run through yours. Um, I'm not going to go really deep on these because of time, but I do want to touch on these briefly. I can start tomorrow. Now, Christians don't like to just say things like, I'm being lazy and I don't want to do it today. So we do things like make it sound super spiritual. And we go, this is just a season. It's just a season. Procrastination can lead to depression and low self-worth. Talking about tomorrow is easier than doing something today. I like looking at Newton's universal law of gravity when, when talking about the, the power of momentum. And, and I get that he's talking about how matter and uh, how energy interact with gravity. But I think it's interesting to look at how matter and energy interact with spirituality. A spaceship uses 80% of its fuel to get off the ground. Only 20% is used in orbit and re-entry. Taking the first step is the hardest. Pastor Baltimore, Josiah, Simeon, we work out in the morning, we go to the gym. And I'm going to tell you what, the first day you go to the gym is the hardest day. The second day is the second hardest day, and the third is the third hardest day. The power of momentum it's easier once you get started. If you can make any changes, no matter how small they are, start today. I tried breathing once. It didn't work. You ever tried going to the gym one day? It's, it's amazing. It doesn't work. I, when I went into the, I went in and asked them, I said, do you guys sell a membership where people lift the weights for you? <laughs> They're like, it doesn't, it doesn't work like that. You have to develop consistency, and it has to be a constant pattern in your life before you'll see the benefits of it. Another thing that we tell ourselves, I'm fine. I'm fine. This can be rooted in denial. It can be used to stay busy to distract us from something else. Am I the only one in here that's ever done that? Yeah. <laughs> Could be a lack of self-awareness. You may not know your needs. This really horrible thing happens when we grow up not getting our needs met. It's excruciatingly painful. Our brains code emotional pain and physical pain in our brain the same way. Our brain does not distinguish between emotional and physical pain. And after enough time, when I don't get my needs met, I start to internalize that my needs are bad, and because it hurts so much and nobody wants to experience rejection, we just decide to turn that off. I don't need people. I don't have needs, because if I don't have needs, I don't have to ask anybody to meet my needs, and then when they fail to meet those needs, I don't have to feel rejected. So sometimes the inability to do self-care is connected to the fact that we have no idea what our needs are. I'm the only one who can help. Let me say something. This is gonna, this is gonna poke a little bit, if not to anybody else in here, to me. Um, I ask my clients really tough questions once they know how much I love them. And so I ask myself these same questions. 
So one of the things that we can say is, I'm the only one who can help. This is something that we won't say out loud, but we say it in the back of our heads. This is a spiritual assignment, or I'm, I'm doing God's work. In the mental health field, we call this grandiosity. It's an overestimation of yourself and an underestimation of who God is. Because you are not the only person God can use to help somebody. If you need to say no, because it's not right for you to say yes, you need to do that, and you need to give somebody else the opportunity to step up and be a blessing to that person. Because by you doing all of the work, you're denying other people of stepping into the call that God has for them. The more I do, the more spiritual I am. We use verses like we must be doers of the word, not just hearers of the word. There was another group of people that believed this. They were known as the Pharisees. Jesus rebukes the Pharisees. In our story where Jesus is the hero, the Pharisees are the antagonist. They're kind of the villains in the story. But I don't really believe in villains. I want to understand more about people. So context matters to me. And so I wanted to know more about the Pharisees and understand who they were. And so because I like to punish myself, I decided to figure out how I can tell you about 400 history, 400 years of Jewish history in about six minutes. This starts... 586 BC, God allowed King Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonian armies to breach the walls of Jerusalem and destroy the temple. This was a result of his divine judgment for their disobedience. The Israelites had a long and complicated history with obedience. It blew my mind when I was studying the Old Testament to understand that there were more Jewish kings and leaders that did not follow God than the ones that did. When, this, when the walls were knocked down in Jerusalem, as spoils of war, the Jewish people were taken back to Babylon. Can you imagine what kind of despair this felt like for them? They thought their covenant had been broken. They thought their God had abandoned them. Everything they knew had been turned upside down. 47 years later, Babylon was defeated by the Persian monarch Cyrus the Great. The Jewish people were allowed to return to their homeland and were allowed to maintain their culture and religious identities. When the Jewish leaders returned, they had a renewed vigor for following the rules and honoring the traditions of their faith. Haggai, who was a minor prophet in the Old Testament, he reminded the Jewish people that faithfulness would return prosperity to the land. And the very first thing that he did was he built a temple to replace the temple that was destroyed, and he did that before ever building the city. So he comes back into this with a new, uh, a, a new lease on worshiping God and honoring God. Now, if we fast forward, Alexander the Great, who was a uh, Macedonian military genius... He was responsible for introducing what's known as Hellenistic culture throughout the Mediterranean. And he conquered all the way across the Mediterranean. And in fact, he wanted to keep pushing through India until he reached the sea, but his generals convinced him after going through Syria to turn back. He arguably is the most romanticized person in all of ancient history. And as soon as he got back home, he ended up dying. After that, his generals fought for the territory that controlled the Jewish land. During two different generals' rules, they would allow people to bribe them to go in and be part of the priesthood in Jewish culture. Can you imagine the outrage? People who worship God with everything in them their traditions, their rituals are so important to them, and people can bribe their way in. It wasn't very long until they were returning to pagan traditions, and there was desecrations of the altars. Can you imagine the outrage? Can you imagine the hurt? 
the fear after what happened last time. This led in 167 BC to what's known as the Maccabean Revolt. There was a first and second war. The ideology that fueled this revolt was from a group called Hasidim, meaning the pious ones. And they were the Jewish priests at the time. And it's largely believed by theological scholars that their descendants were the Pharisees. And the word Pharisee means the separated ones. Because they were never, ever going to allow anybody else to penetrate their culture again and turn their hearts away from God. I can certainly understand it. Now, if you fast forward to Jesus' time, when they're outraged about clothing, when they're outraged about the Sabbath, when they're outraged about who's preaching and how it's being done, this all makes sense. This all makes sense. Here's the connection. Anybody experienced or witnessed social oppression recently, last couple of years? Anybody been present for justice reform, political discord, separations of family? I do, I do therapy with people who say that their families have disowned them because of their spiritual and political beliefs. We're not just the victims in this. I do work with people who have disowned their families because they don't have the same political and religious beliefs. Financial instability, the pandemic. People feel threatened. People feel the stress and the pressure. But the Pharisees had it backwards, and Jesus rebuked them for this. In closing, I want you to think about this. They tried to control their external reality as a way to protect their hearts when what they should have been doing was focusing on guarding their hearts as a way to positively impact their external reality. Do we try to control what's out here? Jesus says no. Jesus didn't judge people and put them into boxes and say that they're off limits. We don't hang out with them. Jesus focused on his heart. Jesus asked his followers to focus on their hearts and then take their light out to the rest of the world. Jesus did not call us to separate. He called us to connect. We are called to be ambassadors to the greatest king that has ever lived. Our ability to do this our ability to show up well in relationships, our ability to show empathy to those who are hurting is directly connected to how well we're taking care of ourselves in the natural. Pastor Baltimore.